I guess you'd have to almost say I'm a, a happy warrior because I remember standing in the woods over there one in the early days, and miserable, rain, you know, trench foot. But I got to thinking, you know, how can I be happy <laughs> in this situation? But I was. And uh, it suddenly dawned on me, my third grade teacher came back to honor, love, honor, and serve God. And it changed my life forever. I was born in 1925, April 12, and I was drafted in uh, July 15th of 1943. I did my basic at uh, Camp Fannin, Texas. You had to take infantry basic first, and then you go to college. They sent us to Louisiana State University and I took one semester down there in engineering. And uh, at the end of that semester, we went back to the infantry, but we went to Camp Maxi, Texas. It was a re relatively new division. It was a good bunch of guys. They were well-trained and we learned a lot. It was hurry up and wait, and you never knew what was going on. And this new radio came out, and they wanted a couple of volunteers from each company. It was called the SCR 300, and it weighed pretty close to 40 pounds. I thought this would be a good opportunity to know what was going on. We finished our training about the uh, first part of September 1944. We got a furlough home for 10 days, I think it was. Came back and immediately shipped up to uh, Boston. Loaded on a ship, the George Athos II went across North Atlantic. We landed at Liverpool and then uh, we went down to London and then about 65 miles southwest was a little town called Blandford. And after three weeks, they took us down to Bournemouth, England, which is a port, and we boarded an LST, the first or second of November. From the harbor, we were trucked in the two and a half ton trucks uh, up to Albel, Belgium. We had to truck at night because we still didn't have air superiority. The very next day, we went up to the front and relieved the 2nd Division. We were a little over a mile in front of a little town called Krinkelt. It was November and the first part of December, and we spent uh, six weeks there, I guess. <laughs> When we first got up on line, we heard the screaming memes, they call them, sat there waiting for them to explode, and we were all on the ground waiting for it. And instead of explosions, we heard click, 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 click. <laughs> and they were just very, very, very small explosives. And they, were, they contained leaflets. You'd pick up the leaflet and said, welcome 99th Infantry Division. Hope you don't find it too hot on this corner. <laughs> Little uh, acknowledgement that they knew what the heck was going on. <laughs> the uh, German intelligence was uh, very, very good. Well, I remember the night of the 15th, we were getting from our sound power telephone. They said there was a lot of noise, tanks moving. And we kept getting these reports from all of our outposts. And that was the first indication 
we had at all that uh, they were amassing their armor for an attack. And of course, I went to bed and forgot about it, you know, until 5.30 the next morning. And I woke up to the most intense artillery barrage, and that lasted for about 25 minutes. After about 25 minutes, they went into what they call a rolling barrage, where the artillery will hit a spot here, and then the next barrage will be 100 yards further, and the troops just kept following that. And this rolled over our front line. And uh, pretty soon, our people that made it were amassing around the CP. And, uh, as uh, darkness fell, I radioed back that we were surrounded and we could use some help. By that time, I think they were trying to go around us, which they did. We uh, were told to assemble the very next morning at 9 a.m. And as I, we got into battalion headquarters, a machine gun opened up on our right. Just a a few seconds after that, I saw this, within 25 feet of me, a lieutenant, and he had his hands in the air. And we all took off to the left and went across this road. We took this road, went uphill, and then suddenly these 105, our own 105, and they were shelling us. And we lost quite a few people in that ravine. All of us that were able, there were quite a few wounded, went out and went up, and top of the hill was a barn, so we uh, went up and started to go uh, to sleep. And then this guy comes by, an officer, he says, we gotta go back and get the wounded. He says, I need some volunteers, you know? And some of us did. And the first guy we came to was a very, very good friend of mine. <clears throat> So we got him out, and by the time we were ready to go for, it was daylight, or getting to be daylight, and so we couldn't, had to leave the rest, whoever there were, there. He had no idea. I mean, it was complete chaos. Nobody had the biggest idea where anybody else was. It was a general retreat for that whole line and we were all going back to this ridge out in front of Elsenborn, the Elsenborn Ridge, which we dug in later on, and uh, we stayed there the better part of six weeks, I guess. From the 16th through about the 23rd, Hitler had the weather on his side. It was so bad that you could see maybe a quarter of a mile. Well, that's not very good for shooting artillery and stuff like that when you can't see where they land, you know. The weather cleared and the Air Force took to the skies to bomb and strafe and fight the rejuvenated Luftwaffe to the ground. I think it was the 23rd, 22nd or 23rd of December, 44. Skies opened up and P-47s and P-51s came in. They just made mincemeat of the Germans. They were never the same after that. You could say that that was a real turning point. The Battle of the Bulge extended to about January 31st and 1st of February, 1945. On the 1st of February, we started what they called the Battle for Central Europe, where we first started attacking and taking back the ground we had lost. We had village after village after village. I can't tell you how many villages we took because we were moving pretty fast. And we started into this village and there was a building to our right and we decided to take cover in that. And we went into the basement the basement had these little windows about 
so big that you could see out. And I put my head up and looked out. <laughs> Here was this tiger tank with a gun leveled right to our house. And I got my head down, and no sooner did I get my head down, and uh, their machine gun had opened up on the tank <laughs> right where my head was. That's unbelievable. In order to keep up morale, they had selected people every week usually, maybe a three-day pass to Brussels or maybe five days in Paris. They had two of them for the whole division, passes to the United States, 30 days. Well, we'd just taken this town. We were in the CP and Sergeant Baker came in. He said, get your gear together, I'm giving this pass to somebody else. <laughs> I could not believe it. That happened about 7th or 8th of April, I think, 1945. So about a month before the end of the war. All I remember is seeing that Statue of Liberty. <laughs> that was a great sight. <laughs> And, uh, of course, the war came to an in Europe, anyhow, it came to an end on the 8th of May. So we went from Fort Sam Houston, which was a redistribution center, to, uh, it was Camp Hood at that time, it's now Fort Hood. And then after that, I was sent to Fort Lewis, Washington. Then on the 2nd of February, which is a great day in my life, 1946, I, uh, was discharged at Fort Lewis. And uh, within a month, I enrolled at Purdue University and graduated with a BS in aeronautical engineering in 1949. And uh, I was two years at uh, Douglas and McDonnell Douglas for 40 years. So I was 42 years in the business. I got married when I came back to St. Louis area. I met her, let's see, it was January of uh, 52. We were married in May of 53. We were married for 63 years. She left a lot of Wonderful memories. <clears throat> and uh, we were blessed with uh, 12 children, six boys and six girls. And 32 grandchildren and one great grandchild. I think the main thing is that we did love our country. And that is a great country. There's no country like it. There isn't. I love it. My first recollection of the World War II was December the 7th, 1941, was a wintry day and I was praying out in the front yard. Yesterday, December 7th. And then my sister came out crying and I said, what's the matter? And they said, there's a Jap bomb Pearl Harbor. And we had radios in, no television. 
So I go inside and mom and dad are listening and it's other Japs and you can hear President United Roosevelt. And we learned then that the war was started. We didn't know anything about it. We were just a kid, it's 14. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. I enlisted in April of 1945. I was still in high school, and just getting out. Dad didn't want me to go into the Army, so that's the reason I went into the Navy to be a, a rear gunner on a, a, a Navy dive bomber. You had a pilot and a co-pilot, and you had a 30 caliber machine gun. An SB-2C dive bomber. That's it, gents, the Hell Diver, sometimes called the SB-2C. She's a scout and a dive bomber, and can deliver depth bombs or a torpedo as well. I knew I was going to be a, a gunner and a radioman, primarily a radioman. Millington, Tennessee was a big training center. It's called the Naval Air Training Center. And they held a, I think it was a four week boot camp down there. Then we all went into shortwave radio. We went down there for that schooling, and then we were going down to Jacksonville and then out to the fleet. I didn't go overseas in World War II. They made me at the conclusion because I had short way, they made me an instru inspector instructor at the Naval Air Training Center there, teaching short wave. And then the war ended real quick. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. Newsmen rush the president's report to a waiting world. And through the early evening, Tuesday, August 14th, the fateful news is flashed. In New York City, as throughout a rejoicing nation and world, vast throngs of grateful, happy people celebrate the end of fighting, the dawn of peace. Two million New Yorkers jam Times Square. It's official. It's all over. It's total victory. Things changed quickly after Truman dropped those two bombs. The whole base went wild. Their people poured out of the, all the troops poured out of the barracks and were marching up and down the streets and hugging and laughing and everybody went absolutely ape that the war was over because we'd been told that uh, we were gonna land very soon in Japan and the guy on either side of us was not gonna make it probably. And right after that bomb, two bombs were dropped, they began to dump people from overseas out in the fleet back to the United States. They tried to get them out of the, out of the service as quick as possible. I got out in June of 46. We were discharged, but we stayed in the reserve. I came home, like all of the others, and I was living at home with my parents. I was 19 then. Just who gets the benefits of this bill? Any veteran, male or female, with more than three months active service. I immediately, the following week, went over to the University, the University of Kansas City at 52nd Rock Hill Road in Kansas City, Missouri. And we had a wonderful GI Bill in those days. So it was great. That's why I could get married so young uh, on my 21st birthday. When you stay in the Navy Reserve, you stayed in the inactive reserve, which you didn't do anything, or the active reserve where you train once a month. After I got into college, the Marine Corps came down and they wanted me to transfer. So I transferred to the Marine Corps at that time. So in 47, I was promoted to, from third class petty officer to a second lieutenant in the United States Re uh, Reserve. And then in 50, when the war broke out, I was a first lieutenant. We didn't know anything was coming. We, we, when it broke out, I'd already had my first college degree in English literature, and I was five months away from uh, getting my law degree. And boom, it broke out, and Truman uh, uh, activated the, the Marine Corps Reserve. The present time, the fear of another great international war overshadows all the hopes of mankind. This fear arises from the tensions between nations 
and from the recent outbreak of open aggression in Korea. And they brought into the Navy and the Marine Corps and, and shipped over, made a part of the 1st Division, which I was. And I went to Able Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines there in Korea. And I went up to the line and I was there for two, three weeks before I pulled off and ordered back to the uh, Marine Corps rear. And they just changed from the old rocks and shoals, the old naval rules that they'd had since the beginning of the colonies. And they, now you had to have a lawyer for the defense, a lawyer for the prosecution, and then a lawyer for the judge. And they scrounged the whole division, and they found four of us. One month I'd be a prosecutor on a general court martial, the next month I'd be a prosecutor on the defense. And we were swamped with, because all we had was uh, general court marshals. It got so cold in the winter, 35 and 40 below, the ink would freeze in the, in the fountain pen. So that stopped the court martial. So then they said we'd ship us to Japan. We'd take all the witnesses. We'd go to Kobe, Japan. It, we loved that. It was nice houses and you got liberty. And, and so we'd drag our feet a little bit there, you know, and take our time trying the cases. In June of 52, I came back and got out of the Marine Corps. I decided at that time I wanted to practice law. And I, I was still in the reserve and I stayed in the active reserve, not the inactive reserve, for years. I was in 17 years, between 1945 and 1962. I had a small law firm, McMullen, Wilson, and Schwartz. Before that, it was, it was uh, Hill and McMullen. And I practiced from June of, of uh, 52 when I got back. I'm still an active lawyer. I still have my card active. Met her in 1944 when we'd moved back from Salina in Center High School. And we got married in 1948, and we were married until she died in 2007. She was a great gal and a great wife, and gave me two fine kids. Well, I volunteered. Everybody wanted to, wanted to serve our country. and. We stayed in voluntarily because we loved our country and we loved the Corps. And there's an old saying that you can take the Marine out of the Corps, but you can't take the Corps out of the Marine. And I think that's self-explanatory. I'd do it again in a, in a moment and be happy to. You'd see all the faces of the guys that didn't make it and didn't come back. And you wonder why them instead of you. No answer. <laughs>